Guys, Thanksgiving and Christmas are coming. They are coming. And for that, I am glad. But here's the thing. With the coming of these holidays also comes a very different kind of warning, a very different kind of problem, a warning that we cannot ignore, a problem that honestly is hard to measure, but arguably affects, I would guess, at least 60, if not up to 80% of Americans. And as a result, as a result, instead of celebrating all that we have to be thankful for. And instead of celebrating truly and fully celebrating the the coming of Christ as our Redeemer, these holidays continue to become more and more marred by our culture's lust for worldly possessions. And the coveting of what we are convinced other people have which we don't, and, and the added long-term debt and long-term pressure and anxiety we put upon ourselves by trying to obtain, by trying to obtain the kind of items or the, the lifestyle that we think brings about happiness, but instead pulls us all the more further from joy and contentment and peace. Carl, that was your cue to give me a big amen. Guys, today, this morning, we are going to take a look, a quick but a very hard look at coveting. Coveting. Guys, coveting is a word I suspect many people are not really truly familiar with, unfortunately. I doubt the dangers of coveting are being taught in our schools And sadly, I doubt it's something that parents spend regular time anyway talking to their children about. But it is, it is, it is something that we as a church here at Open Door are very much wanting to look at and talk about and to try and and really seek to understand. Do you hear me? So here we go. Guys, I honestly believe, I honestly believe of the Ten Commandments, it really seems as though people think of the first nine commandments, and then there's the tenth. And then there's the tenth. Do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery. Yes, absolutely, we easily see the value of these and the other first nine commandments. But honestly, I think most Christians think of the tenth commandment as the eh, no big deal of commandments. And I think this is horribly, horribly unfortunate. I think it's a shame because, guys, I think, I truly believe that the Tenth Commandment may very well be the, the most frequently broken of the commandments, which thus bring about the most frequent effects of dysfunction and brokenness in people's lives. So what does the Tenth Commandment say? Well, you can look it up. It's in Exodus chapter 20. Do you want to know how you remember it's in Exodus chapter 20? Well, Exodus is really one of the big time books of the law, and I like to think of it as 2020. You want to have good vision, then make sure that you know what the the Ten Commandments are. This commandment is recorded in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. I'll read it for you. It says this. It says, you shall not covet. Everyone say covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's spouse. You should not covet your neighbor's mouse. That's not right. His servants, his servants, um, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything, anything that is your neighbor's. So what does the word covet mean? actually mean? Well, the Old Testament Hebrew word for covet is pronounced chamad. You want to say that with me? It's fun. Chamad, right? 
That's the word for covet in the Hebrew Old Testament. It means to strongly want for yourself what another person possesses. Have you ever been downstairs working in the nursery and uh, there's a child and the child is, is there playing with the, the bus and the, and the bulldozer, you know, you know, and he's just having the time of his life, happy as can be, until the other boy, a new boy, comes into the nursery, and then he goes and he finds himself a toy, a dump truck, mm, that actually dumps. Shame on them for making dump trucks that don't dump, Right? And he starts playing with the dump truck. And then what notoriously happens with the first child? <gasps> He's got a dump truck. And suddenly, suddenly, his bus, you know, which is crashing into the bulldozer, is not good enough. And what does the little boy do? He leaves his and he goes and he tries to grab the other toy from the other boy. You have all seen it. Can I have an amen? Yes, Pastor Jeff from the gallery. You know what I'm talking about. So what does the word covet actually mean guys again it means to strongly strongly want for yourself what another person possess possesses do you need a visual i'll help you king david oh yeah yeah Oof. yeah king david was the most powerful person in israel guys honestly he was probably the most powerful person in the world at that time and the truth is, he had pretty much an unlimited pool of women, which he could choose from to marry. And yet, everyone say, and yet. Say it again. One more time. And yet, he coveted another man's wife. Uti or Uriah. I almost tried to combine Hittite with Uriah. That doesn't work. Uriah, the Hittite's wife. What was her name? Bathsheba. He coveted Uriah's wife. And his coveting, his coveting led to adultery. And the adultery led to lying and deception. And the lying and the deception led to murder. All of which, all of which led to a ton of heartache, brokenness, grief, and regret. Finally, finally coming repentance. What are the kinds of things? Because this is the, really a huge question. What are the kinds of things a person can covet? Well, the Bible gives us some examples, does, doesn't, doesn't it? You know, right there in, in, in the Tenth Commandment, uh, don't covet your neighbor's house or spouse, servants, donkeys, maid servants, man servants, all this stuff. Okay, that's all great and good for 2,000, 4,000 years ago, but what about coveting a neighbor's job? Coveting a neighbor's job. Or coveting the vacations that a particular neighbor is seemingly always going on. Or their popularity. Oh, women. Oh, I saw y'all kind of. Oh. Or their income. I heard Lexus. I think I heard somebody say. Um, I think another big one, their success. Why are they so stinking successful? Why is it that everything that they, they touch seems to succeed? Ugh, why can't I? Why can't I? Because I think these are the popular things that people today tend to covet. I can't believe how everyone likes her. I can't believe that she, she takes a picture of her cat sitting in the window. Big whoop! And there's 500 likes and 15 reposts? What's up with that? What's up with that? I can't believe all the things that he gets to go and do, the places he gets to go, restaurants that he, he goes to and eats, and all of that sort of stuff. Now, guys, let me ask you the question. Why? Why does the Bible say 
coveting is a sin. Why does the Bible say that coveting is bad? Because I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I know a lot of people who, who believe that seeing something that, that they want is a good thing because it's going to inspire them. It's going to help them to work hard so that they can achieve those things for themselves. Guys, do you hear how messed up that statement is? Do you seriously hear how messed up that is? Implying that a achievement has to do with acquiring things that is a lie of the devil if you buy into that if you are listening to that you are listening to the devil and yet everyone say and yet again and yet guys that is pretty much what society today believes Having a new Corvette isn't good enough. I have to have the new trim model with the bigger engine. That one, that one just really kind of messes with my head, but I digress. Are you guys ready for this? No? Okay, I'll wait until... Oh, you are? Okay. Number one. Everyone say number one. I got to make sure you guys are here with me. Listen to this. Write this down. Memorize this. Number one. Coveting destroys relationships. Coveting destroys, destroys relationships. Guys, I read one of the most interesting articles this week that I've read in a long time. Are you ready for this? No, you're not. You're not ready for this. I'm going to tell you anyway. The name of the article, the article was called, Does Your Neighbor's Income Affect Your Happiness? I just want you to wrestle with that and think about that for just a few moments. Does your neighbor's income affect your happiness? Guys, I think I would love, love, love to see a poll done across the United States asking people that exact question. In this article, it wasn't an extensive study, but the findings did very much tend to show that in America, the income of neighbors do appear to affect or influence people's happiness. Let me give you an example. There was a strong correlation showing that 75% of the neighbors that people say they dislike happen to also be those neighbors who appear to make more money than them. Do you seriously think that that's just a coincidence? Do you seriously think that? Coveting destroys relationships. Say it. Coveting destroys relationships. Number two, are you ready for this? Coveting, coveting causes people to purchase things they cannot afford. Ouch. Coveting causes people to purchase things they cannot afford, causing them to live outside of their means. Oh, man, Jeff, stop it. Come on. Living outside of their means, bringing about further what? Debt. Bringing about further debt, bringing about huge amounts of stress that far long outlasts the momentary false sense of joy that has already escaped them. Did you write it down? Because you should. Guys, coveting causes people to purchase things they cannot afford, causing them to live outside of their means, bringing about further debt, bringing about huge, huge, huge long-term amounts of stress that far long outlast the momentary false sense of joy, the false sense of joy that has already escaped them. Guys, this one mm, is going to hurt. It is estimated 42%, not 40%, not 45%. I don't really remember who did this poll, but they were very specific. 42. So they've done their homework, I think. 42% of families living paycheck to paycheck over the next two months, right now, 
over the next two months will go an additional $1,700 more in debt trying to keep up with what they see the Joneses down the road having. 42% of those living paycheck to paycheck will further dig themselves into a flat-out miserable mess of a hole by going an additional $1.7,000 into further debt. Guys, coveting, coveting causes people to live outside of their means. Oh, my lands, but did you see that? Oh, my lands, look what they did to their house. Oh, my lands, look at the clothes. Oh, my lands, look at the whatever. Coveting causes people to live outside of their means, adding more debt, adding more long-term stress to their lives. And you want to know what? The devil just sits back and laughs. Huh, God's people, look how miserable they are. Ha, ha, can't wait till next Black Friday. Ha, ha. Now, I'll be a bit surprised if I don't catch some flack on this next one, but I don't care. Number three, are you ready? I don't think you are. Coveting often brings about a false sense of inequality. Coveting often brings about a false sense of inequality. Do not misinterpret me. I am not saying that there's not an absolute, oh, I wanted to say something a little bit too flamboyant. Let's dial it back. I am not implying or saying in any way that there's not an outrageous, horrible, 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 ridiculous amount of inequality that's going out on out there. I'm not saying that. I'm not implying that in any way, shape, or form. But what I am saying, what I am saying is that coveting can often bring about a false sense of inequality. People love to throw that word around today. They do. You hear it all the time. Inequality, inequality, inequality. They throw it all over the place. And yet, guys, and yet, listen, most people who feel this refuse to think about the three to five hours each night certain kids spent doing homework while going above and beyond to try and learn everything they could to master the, the, the field in which they wanted to, to, to work in as an adult. Or they refuse to think about the $50,000. I wish my undergraduate only cost $50,000. But they refuse to think about the $50,000 many people spend going to college. And the four additional years of study and study and study. Or the additional twenty grand spent on going to grad school. They tend not to think about the long 50-hour work weeks to try and just get ahead. Or those who work extra shifts so that they can pay their house off sooner. I uh, was at the Pacers game um, the other day. Uh, Gary, Indiana, and I went up there to the Pacers game. Actually, I guess that's down there. I'm thinking of Gary. But... Um, we went down there, and there was a guy I was sitting next to, and we shouldn't have been in these seats. They were mid-court. They were in the second row in the club level. Um, Gary didn't pay for them, but they were given to him by his workplace. That was awesome. The guy next to me was really, really rich. I could tell. I mean, everybody in that area was really, really rich. But um, I was just talking to the guy, and we had a conversation. He said, yeah. He said, oh, thank the Lord. I'm 42 years old, and I finally got my house paid off. Mm. Do you not think there for a little bit I kind of coveted that? A little bit. A little bit. Mm. And yet I don't mind working, you know, extra hours doing this or doing that or a little side hustle. Uh, Ken O'Dell, amen to the little side hustles in order to, to get a little bit more money to put on the, the mortgage payment or, or whatever else to get those things paid off early. Okay, so often, often people don't think of those things. The amount of, I'm crying out loud, do you know how many schools you have to go to to be a doctor? Don't be a doctor. You get your four-year undergraduate, I think a three-year master's degree, a two-year doctorate, and then I think you have to do a special program 
in your specific area. So I think it's, it adds up to about 12 years of school. And can you imagine the debt? Oh, my, there's a doctor. You see how much money he makes? Oh, all right. Okay, so often people don't tend to see those kinds of things. People just tend to see someone who has far more nice things than they do. And they don't consider what it costed them to reach that level, that level of living, if you will. Instead, they simply feel animosity towards them or perhaps a sense of inequality. The fact is, guys, I want to tell you something. I really do want you to hear these next you know, couple of minutes here. I, I think this will be important for you to hear. I think all of this is important for you to hear. Guys, God created us to be free beings, free beings to do and to live as we choose. You get to do what you want. You can go home and do what you want. Now, I will tell you, God does tell us very clearly in his word, throughout his word, God does tell us how we can live joy-filled lives, good lives, happy lives, joy-filled lives, lives of peace, lives of satisfaction, lives of purpose. Oh, man, purpose is huge. All of these kinds of things. He does tell us how we can have those kinds of lives, but, but he gives us through freedom. He gives us the freedom to either embrace those things, to embrace his word, or to reject them. He doesn't care for robots, and he hates slaves, uh, slavery. Uh, he, we have freedom for these kinds of things. But the fact is, guys, in the Bible, do you know that there are 200, no, no, 2,350 verses in the Bible concerning the topic of money? 16 of the 38 parables deal with the topic of money. And the only subject Jesus talked about more than money was the kingdom of God. Guys, Dad, I'm going to ask you a question. You're going to like this question. And you're going to be able to answer this question. Everyone say, hi, Dad. Um, if the cameras want to fan... No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <clears throat> Dad, does the Bible say... It is wrong to be wealthy. Yes or no? He says no. Is my dad correct? Wow, dad, you did good. You're, you are correct. The Bible does not say that it is wrong to be wealthy. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. But guys, I got to tell you, regarding wealth... Regarding wealth, I do very much appreciate what John Wesley, did John Wesley write any of the books of the Bible? No, he was a pastor, but I tell you what, God used him maybe more than just about any pastor in somewhat modern history, but, but I don't know if that's really even true, but I do like what John Wesley had to say about money. He said, as Christians... Do you claim to be a Christian? As Christians, we should earn all we can and we should save all we can so that we can be a blessing to all we can i like that i like that i like that a lot but likewise one last time everyone say but likewise but likewise, guys, I don't think that there is anything wrong with someone who wants to live a simple life, holding a meager job, perhaps not working as many hours as someone else, if that's what they want. And, and so long as they are able to live within their means. What I do think is incredibly frustrating is when people do not live within their means, regardless of how much money they make. Because I know people that make a quarter of a million dollars a year who fail miserably to live within their means. And I know people who, whose family incomes are less than $40,000 a year 
who fail to live within their means. And I'm equally, equally frustrated, honestly, with both of them. I think even worse, though, I think even worse is when they feel cheated or slighted by those who appear to be better off than them. Guys, I have news for you. It is a free country. If you want more, then go and find a way to earn more. Seriously. Seriously. Ultimately, I like what it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. All of these are in your bulletin. Um, you'll be able to find these online. You can go back. But ultimately, I like what it says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money. Stop loving money and try loving God. That's what I like. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. We could sit there and start quoting all kinds of scriptures. Consider the lilies of the field. See how wonderfully dressed that they are. And I tell you, Solomon, even in all of his glory, never looked like one of these. Right? Right? I mean, do you seriously think that, oh, my lands, I'm, I'm not going to have enough, and then I won't be able to have my Funyuns and my Cheetos and my Doritos and my Burritos and whatever he does. And yet that's where people are. Guys, you have probably heard me say before, and I really earnestly believe this, and I'm almost done, so yay, right? Everyone say, yay. Yay, Pastor Jeff's doing good. Look at that. Look at that. You've probably heard me say before that um, if you knew, if you knew 20 years ago, if you knew 20 years ago that you would have the kind of phone, TV, car, home, clothes, etc., if you knew the amount of hair, no, not that, um, <laughs> right? But if you knew 20 years ago the kind of phone and the kind of TV and the kind of car and the kind of home and the kind of clothes and the kind of whatever that you have today, you would probably be blown out of your mind, excited, saying, hot dog, I can't wait for those 20 years to get here. Hot dog, hot diggity, diggity dog. But the fact, everyone say, but the fact, I lied. Then I said one more time, but I just made you do it again. But guys, honestly... But the fact, even though you have these things today, because you see other people with even more nice things, you feel less than satisfied. Why? You feel less than satisfied. If not, downright disappointed. Some of you may be even mad. Guys, that right there is nothing, nothing, nothing less than the effect of coveting. Coveting. The Tenth Commandment. Because I'm so afraid that many of you have already begun to buy into the lie that you have to purchase a Merry Christmas for this year. I hope not. I'm so afraid that many of you are going to spend more than your means, more than your means, one more time, more than your means. I'm scared that you're going to do that. Thus going into debt, debt that will take you three times longer to pay off than you anticipate, bringing about a huge amount of additional stress in your life that will far, far, far last longer than the momentary false sense of joy that honestly has already escaped you. I am so afraid that many of you, instead of focusing on what you have to be thankful for, and instead of focusing on what you have to, to worship God for, by giving us his, his, his only son, you will instead be robbed, pickpocketed, by giving so much of your attention to what you think others have, which you don't. <laughs> 